Okay. So, um, talking about labor market and determining things that might impact wages, uh, we'll probably start the discussion on discrimination and uh, kind of set us up for next week to really dive a little bit deeper into that. But there was a couple things, um, one thing specifically I want to kind of start out with that was related to what we did last class. And I think I, I did a version of this, um, but I, I want to be a little bit more explicit in talking about it. So I'll do another example. I also uh, put up next homework, which is due, um, I think it's, I it's the seventh. I have it set for that Thursday, whatever that Thursday is that we're in class. Um, we do by the end of the day, so you can bring it to class or what is the canvas. We really have covered, you can could work through the entire thing. We've covered everything um, that you would need. So I would suggest working on it earlier as opposed to later um, because you know, we're gonna get further and further removed from the material. I also probably kind of put up another homework assignment before the due date of that one, since you know we've got quite a bit of time. We've already covered all the material. I'll probably get the next one up um, probably at the end of next week, um, just so you can start working on that one as, as well. Um, so try to try to start, you know, even though the due date is the seventh, maybe try to get it done by the end of next week might be a good goal. Okay. So one thing that it talks about that I wanted to make sure I go over a little bit more explicitly is we're thinking about labor markets and roster limitations. So let's say we've got the demand curve for labor here, supply curve for labor is up here. We could identify kind of where the equilibrium quantity oops, and wage would be. So let's say, you know, um, I think probably the best way to practically think about this is after the team kind of goes out and obtains some of the players that it wants to kind of fill out its you know, starting lineup or kind of its, its main players, it generally fills out the rest of its roster with a lot of reserves, maybe even practice play of team or oh, sorry, players that are just kind of there for the, the practice squad at the NFL or kind of your reserve players. So we should probably be thinking about, you know, maybe the roster limit is going to be set at 25. But really, right, after you go out and get those 10 main players that are going to play the most, or if you maybe think about basketball here, you know, about 10 to 12 players probably that play the most in the games, we're kind of thinking about what remains. So even though we kind of say roster limits and those might be set at 25, maybe you're thinking it's more so like you know, 10 or 15 spots left, right, that I want to fill out with reserves, but I can't go past that point. So let's say, you know, it doesn't really matter necessarily what that, that number is. But maybe we've got, I don't know, 10 remaining roster spots that we just want to fill out with kind of these low quality players. Maybe we think of them all kind of having a similar value to us. But right? if you think about the demand curve for labor, the value of your reserves is going to be all very, very low and probably pretty similar to each other. Right. If we're, you know, if we've got two players and they both don't play any minutes. They're both adding the same number of wins. Right. And so. Maybe we've got 10 spots left that we want to fill out with these reserve players that we can't, um, or that, that would be the equilibrium. But for whatever reason, you know, whatever the roster limit that the league is set, I only have, I don't know, maybe five remaining, right? So because of this roster limit, if it's an effective kind of roster limitation or roster cap, I guess we're looking at that way, it's going to be something below that equilibrium quantity that a, a team really would like to have maybe. 10 additional players kind of for the practice squad or reserves, but there's only five remaining spots. Right? So maybe think about here, the roster limit maybe was set at 25, which means we only had like five remaining spots after we kind of got our, our main players that were going to play. And so as a result, we can kind of think about where's the new equilibrium quantity of labor, where's the new equilibrium wage? Well, the new equilibrium quantity of labor is going to be, right, kind of wherever that roster limit kind of, kind of ends, right, whenever we fill out that roster. But we know as the, the players, right, because I'm able to kind of get those best reserve players, the very last player is going to add the value of the marginal wins from labor from that player is going to be wherever we're at on that demand curve, right? Because the demand curve for labor tells us the value of the additional wins that player brings in. So with this roster limit, we know that teams would be willing to play that last player now slightly higher wage. 
Um, so we think about these roster limits, potentially we see kind of higher, higher wages there. And it's because, you know, of the remaining players, it's not that they all have exactly the same quality, right? There is a slight decline as I'm adding a certain number of players, right? So, you know, I'll take the best player, you know, reserve player first, then the second best reserve player, so on and so forth. And so if this roster limitation doesn't allow me to kind of get to that, that tenth worker, we would see the wage for the fifth worker, wherever the roster limit would kind of result, whatever quantity the roster limit would result in, seems to be willing to pay slightly higher wages to those reserve players now because it knows it's not going to be kind of having some of these who have slightly lower valuations or bring in less kind of revenue per additional win that, the, that they're bringing. So these roster limitations, we would kind of identify that wage wherever we would hit that point in the green. Okay. Any questions on, on that for that go into some, some newer, okay, some new material. This is kind of old. I just wanted to make sure that I was, was uh, being specific about this. Now you can think about, you know, what if I had like a demand curve shift here? So the demand curve maybe for labor shifts up. Well, if my roster limit is still set, my quantity can't change. All that's going to do is increase the wages paid to those players. Okay. Excuse me. Any questions before we move on from this? I just want to make sure I kind of covered this and look at the labor market a little before we jump into the, some other, other stuff here. Okay. So um, we kind of already talked about this last class. I alluded to it when we were talking about the idea of that the union oops, actually fought kind of from the two leagues combining. And the reason why is because they know once the leagues combined, they had monopsony power, right? So kind of the reverse of that idea is if we had just one league, why might rival leagues be a good idea? Well, that's because they basically eliminate monopsony power, right? Monopsony power, kind of, this is the employer, or I guess here the demander of labor, right? We only had one league that was demanding labor, and so they could kind of get away with paying lower wages. But if there's a rival league, now we've got some competition. We eliminate that monopsony power, and wages kind of go back to the higher equilibrium wage without the monopsony power existing. So we kind of already went over this model. But I, I think I had a slide here that I just want to make sure I mention that again. But could we see that rival leagues actually lower wages? Right? So if I had a rival league, how might I see lower wages there? Well, it's also going to eliminate monopoly power, right? Potentially can eliminate the union. Unless the union you know, goes across leagues, right, across both of the leagues, potentially it has the ability, right, to eliminate some of that monopoly power. Because now if I want to get a player, like I don't have to get a player from the union, from the NBA, if I start my own you know, basketball league, I can go kind of get players that aren't in the union. So potentially we could see lower wages if we had rival leagues exist, but that's only if their players don't unionize as well. Right? Now, we don't really have a, a lot of good examples of this where we've had rival leagues for, for an extended period of time, but this is kind of a hypothetical what, what could happen. Okay. Is this, this clear? I mean, we can go, you know, you, all, you would, all I would do is just draw a model of monopsony power and then get rid of the monopsony power and think about a perfectly competitive market here. Okay. So, whoops. Um, yeah, I don't know. We, we kind of went over strikes and lockouts last uh, class. One thing I did have a, a kind of a good, um, a good question. If we think about the idea of these contract zones and you know, sometimes we said, well, what if the union kind of proposes something that the league is not willing to accept, right? Whether or not this is optimism, pessimism, or there's just no overlap in the contract, zone, right? So think about if the, well, I think I just said this one. So if the union proposes something and the league won't accept it, and really what we're thinking about here is, yeah, the union was the one that proposed something that wasn't accepted, but the party that's not okay with the proposal is the one that's going to then cause the uh, halt in, in play, right? And so the union proposes something the league just isn't willing to accept. And so there, that leads to the league kind of instituting a lockout, right? Whereas if we have the league proposes something to the union, and the union 
doesn't find it acceptable or you know doesn't want to accept it well even though the league is the one that proposed it the union is the one that's going to halt play and so here we would have a strike right so strikes are going to be coming from the union the lockout is coming from kind of the, the league right so i want to be a little bit clear on that as we're kind of talking through things and thinking about strikes and lockouts and we've seen several in the curve had one in major league baseball this year didn't last very long um Kind of makes that I don't know, blows my mind because if you think about the losses, even over like two weeks of games, uh, you know, and also you're shifting the demand curve by potentially consumers not liking the fact that you want a lockout, you know, what they couldn't, you know, budge a little bit on, but then decided to two weeks post blows my mind because that, you know, there's they, no, they didn't really gain any anything in those two weeks. All they did was kind of lose additional revenue. So, but that's a little bit of an aside. So here we've kind of got. Um, just to be a little bit more precise about what we're thinking about these contract zones and some of these proposals. So we see these strikes occur across every single league has had at least, you know, some kind of a strike or lockout, even in, in relatively recent years. I didn't even add in the most recent one, but right, we had one where we, we even canceled this right, or we didn't have any, any postseason. So what's the major negative effect? Well, I just kind of already alluded to it, right? We have, I don't even know if I put the bullet point in there. It's more of a question and I already answered it before we got here. But it's the idea of you're just the loss of revenue of playing those games, right? You're losing broadcast, ticket revenue. There's a lot of revenue lost for the league. But also for the players, right? If revenue is lost from the league, what's going to happen to their subsequent wages? Well, if you think about that demand curve for labor, if we've lost revenue, now you know, there's less revenue to be made from, from kind of each win shift down that demand curve, we would expect to see lower wages as well. So it doesn't matter. Like you might think about, oh, it's a strike. It's hurting the teams and not the players. Well, they are suffering too, not quite directly, but indirectly they, their wages will be lowered if enough revenue is lost. Right? So, you know, we don't want to see this occur. Um, I kind of already used this to make a point with the contract zone, but it is interesting to think about salary kind of caps and, and kind of some of the agreements that these sides make. And so the, this one I always kind of thought was, was a good one to think through. So salary caps for rookies, right? This was a, the idea that I brought up last, last night. Should have Googled, I forget. Sometime between 2010 and 15, there, this was instituted. So they're kind of comparing those two time periods. Looks like maybe 2011 might've been when it was. So if we think about, they were putting caps on the amount of money these rookies could be paid. You might think about this is a bad thing for the players that they're getting less money. And this was probably something more so that the teams were pushing for. But why might the union actually been the one that was kind of pushing for this the most? So what players are hurt by this rookie salary cap maximum? Hmm? High quality rookies right? Who was probably being hurt prior to this um, salary cap by these rookies being paid exorbitant amounts of money? Every other player on the team, right? If, they, if the rookies are getting higher amount and they don't pan out, well, now there's just less money to go around for the other players. So really every other player, right, who is already in the league is looking at this and saying, yeah, we would actually like there to be a, a, a you know lower cap on how much these rookies are able to be paid, right? So that the teams have you know, more money to kind of spread spread across all players, right? So this was actually kind of what happened that the union was actually pushing this a lot more than these, these NFL teams. Although they probably weren't terribly upset by it, by it either, right? Being able to get the same level of talent, but for much lower, much lower wages, okay? And we kind of went through that. Um, kind of the idea of salary caps last week or last uh, class. So I won't go too, too deep into this, but it is worth mentioning and it kind of allows us to think about some interesting thing when we're interesting things when we're looking at the salaries of players. But you know, what's worth more $10 million today or $10 million next year? Hopefully, I, by the time you've gotten to this point, you're kind of upper level, right? We should know that's always good to have money today. You can invest it, right? And then a year from now, you would actually have more than $10 million, right? So it's always better to have kind of money today as opposed to tomorrow and kind of think about, we can actually even think about what the present, you know, how much could I have next year? Well, 10 million times, whatever that 
okay, so the rate of return is going to be there. Is it very safe fast? So we just think about the interest rate or, or whatever we're kind of investing at the moment. So, and you know, you could kind of walk backwards as well. $10 million next year is worth 10 million divided by one plus, whatever that, that rate of investment would be. So teams are really going to exploit this. And when they're making deals, they try to backload contracts. This is kind of the terminology of, I'm putting the majority of the money on the end of the contract. So if I have a 10 year contract, I would like to pay them more in the eighth, ninth and 10th year than I am in the first, second, third, right? Because the further out that goes, this is worth less and less. So this is just one year. If I wanna know how much $10 million is worth 10 years from now, it would be 10 over, you know, or sorry, 10 million, how much is $10 million worth today? If I get it 10 years later, right? It would be divided by one plus that rate of return to whatever power, however many years out I'm going. Right? So the teams teams like to backload these contracts, um, you know, but it's interesting because whatever value you see in the media, like, uh, you know, what's uh, what's a recent one? Um, oh, who just signed the big, uh, Stafford signed a big contract. I think it was like 160 million over, I think, for four years or something like that. So they give you the total amount of the contract. They don't tell you that the majority of that may come in the later years, making the net present value of it worth a little bit less. Right? And so we never really see the, the true value of these contracts because the media is not doing any discounting and they're, they're wanting to you know, get the largest value that they can for their headline. Right? Um, this is a little bit of an aside, but I don't know how many of you are, are you know, sports fans or even football fans, but uh, I was reading something and see if you can think about what they're doing. So the NFL, um, Deshaun Watson just got traded with the Browns, but signed, signed, signed a huge contract in, in, in that process, right? And so I forget how many years it goes out, but it's, it's is it five or six years? So a huge, huge contract, right? The problem is he's done some not so great things off the field and potentially is going to get suspended probably for the first half or the entire first season. But, you know, we don't know what the league's going to do, but that's kind of what's, what's been tossed around. Well, even if it's just the first half of the season, what might that team do that's really advantageous to them, but also to him if he loses out on the salary of those games that he's suspended? So if I think he might be suspended the first eight games and I can kind of decide of this 250 million, how much is he gonna get be getting in each year? What might I want, what might I try to do? That first year, yep, that first year make it as low as I possibly can. Get it, you'll pay him as low as I possibly can um, with that he's willing to accept, which you know, if I was him, I would say zero dollars if it was possible, because if I get suspended, now I don't have to you know, any percent of zero is zero, right? So that's actually what they did is I believe they gave, gave him the minimum for that first year, whatever they get away with paying him. And that way it's good for him, but it's also really good for the team because now they can take all that money, put it onto the later years, and the net present value of that contract is going to be much less than $250 million. So you see teams do this a lot where they're, I think uh, another really good example of this um, Oh man, I'm gonna forget who it was now. There was a player on the Mets, and he did something wild, like sign a 25-year contract, like in the last year or two of his career. And so the Mets were paying. I wish. Does anyone know who I'm talking about? No, I mean, yeah, there you go. I was gonna say I, I'm not gonna be able to come up with the name, but, but right to the teams, they like this because the value of you know they can get away with, you know paying him $1 million a year for the next 25 years, but a million dollars 25 years from now is not worth near a million dollars today, right? So you see teams do this a lot and it also allows them to have kind of less cap hits in current years. And so, and they, what they expect in production is that salary caps will just continue to increase. So 25 years from now, a million dollars isn't gonna even, you know, make them bat an eye when it comes to kind of being under that salary cap. So we see teams play around with this, this time value of money a lot. Another one that um, players are able to kind of exploit the time value of money for them, they want as much money early as possible. And unless we've got, you know, a Sean Watson case, 
Um, but they would want it as soon as possible, which makes the signing bonuses really valuable because then I get all this money up front. I can then invest it, right? I don't have any discounting of, of that money if I'm giving it to that. So we mentioned a little bit last class, there's two types of signing bonuses. And now we've got signing, you know, both sides kind of finding them attractive. So a, a huge signing bonus that's you know, linked to performance in this current year might be a really good thing for the player. It might be a really good thing for the team. Because the player likes, well, the team likes it because it doesn't count against the cap. The player likes it because of this time value of money. Um, I think I'll go through this a little bit and then we'll kind of jump into some discrimination stuff. So I was, I, I, uh, I believe the um, authors of the book, I don't think this is actually in the book, but a paper they had or a little article that they wrote up was kind of the idea of this Michael Jordan paradox, which I call it. Right? So if we look back at the data, Michael Jordan signed an eight year deal worth $25 million, that ended in 1996, right? So we had this, you know, today this is you know, pennies, right? If we're looking at some of the contracts that are signed. So after 96, he made 30, $33 million, right? So, I mean, within two years, he, what, 60, almost tripled what he made in the previous eight, right? Arguably one of the best players, we could kind of put his kind of total across that, that time period, right around $100 million, okay? We then look at, Players like Zach Randolph and Rasheed Wallace, which Zach Randolph might be getting such a dated reference. I don't, you might, guys might even recognize the name, but these are not like the greatest players. Rasheed Wallace was decent for a couple of years, but both of them made well over $100 million over their playing career. And I think I, I chose these two because they had the same number of years in terms of their playing career as Michael Jordan. So how are we getting wages that don't line up with this quality? I, I can guarantee you that Michael Jordan had a much higher you know, value of the marginal wins coming from his labor than these other two players. So why wasn't he getting a wage that was kind of, kind of higher, right? Also said differently, how could the Bulls maybe have actually paid Michael Jordan less than 30, than, uh, than 30 and 33 millions in those last two years? So we'll kind of take a look at this. Now, Michael Jordan's a little bit of an exception, I think in this time period, right? Um, it's not like he was thinking about going to other teams. So what I'm about to show you won't quite line up with the idea of Michael Jordan himself. So maybe think about a player um, who has been with a team for the you know, vast majority of their career. Maybe we'll go with, uh, maybe a recent one, maybe like Aaron Rodgers, right? Thinking about going to other teams. Why might he actually be, you know, Green Bay might actually be able to pay him a lower wage to stay there than other teams would have to pay him to kind of leave and go there. So we'll think about this over here, right? So if I've got my labor market, and we're thinking about, uh, I'm gonna track my phone today. So I've got my supply curve for labor here, my demand curve for labor here. So if we remember that the supply curve kind of reflects marginal costs. Then uh, I'll try to find it. So we've got, you know, maybe this is our equilibrium wage, quantity of labor. I want to make sure I show you that. So I think I'm going to go with So we'll call this kind of W1. And then we'll just do Q1 down here. So let's say this player has been with his team for, for a really long time. And let's just to, to kind of assume it away, assume that every team has the same demand for this player's labor, right? So the demand for this player's labor is the same across every single team, right? He, he brings in, you know, maybe we have no difference in market size. So the marginal revenue per win is the same. We, you know, we've got the number of additional wins that player or the quality of the player can bring the same across all teams. Right? However, if this player has been with this current team for you know, 10, 15 years and thinking about going somewhere else, what might be different in terms of the costs, right? So it might be that if we think about the player's marginal cost, it's if I go to another team, what am I giving up, right? And so potentially going to other teams right, would be a lot more costly because there might be shifts in, you know, 
fans may be less likely to then, uh, they might have a negative view of that player. So maybe some of their apparel sales are lower. Uh, maybe some of their things outside of basketball, they could take a kind of hit in revenue. So maybe it's more costly. Oops. For this player, we'll call this uh, kind of to leave their current team and go somewhere else. Right? So in order to attract that player to leave, we'll call this the, the leave wage. So these teams who are trying to convince them to leave would have to pay them a much higher wage. And even if we don't think about it in terms of an equilibrium, like let's say, we want to think about even if they got the same quantity of labor, we would think about that leave wage, even at the same quantity, would have to be higher as well. Right? So the idea is that you know, the Bulls you know, aren't really competing with anyone else because when they offer this lower wage, they know that other teams can't increment, incrementally offer a slightly higher wage because that player wouldn't leave. Because it's very costly to that player if they go to this other city after building a reputation, building a, a fan base that some of their revenue is going to be tied to. So potentially we see something going on there where if you have a player who's kind of synonymous with a team, leaving may actually negatively impact that player. And so it's more costly to leave. Their supply curve to other teams is going to be lower, which would require those other teams to pay a higher wage. But the problem is if those other teams pay this higher wage, what's the value of that player to the team way down here, right? So if they want to get the same quantity of labor from that player, they're going to have to pay a premium. That wage they would pay is going to be higher than the value of the actual player. So whatever team they're currently on has kind of a competitive advantage there, right? They're not really competing evenly with these other teams and they can get away with offering these lower wages and convincing the player to come stay. Now, this kind of assumes that this player is making money outside of right, revenue outside of playing basketball, and that's why it's more or less costly. So, you know, really, this probably only applies to high level players who are making a significant amount of money uh, based off of their, their fan base or their consumer base outside of, of kind of their, their salary in the league. Um, but it definitely is something that, that we can think you know, that does occur for those players. Probably not, you know, your bench players, but, but some of the other ones. Actually, another interesting idea here is then I want to make sure it, what I'm not saying that players would do this ahead of time. Yeah. What, what's the top so I so I was just kind of using both these points. So if we did allow it to get to an equi equilibrium, we would see the wage being higher. But the idea idea there being, well, for the team, they would like to get the same quality, you know, quantity of labor out of the player. In fact, they would actually have to pay an even higher wage than that. Uh, what was I saying? Top player. Oh, I'm not saying players would do this, but what an optimal strategy here would be that if you think about is I want to ensure that teams always kind of have, there's always going to be competition for my labor, right? That it's not going to be more costly for me to be on certain teams compared to others. So if you looked at, I've never seen someone who's been interesting to look at kind of the salaries paid to players after they've been with the team for 10 years or players who routinely switch teams. So maybe you think about someone like, uh, oh, who's someone I've, oh, I've seen a, a good meme of like Shaq in like 12 different colored uniforms, like every color, right? So the idea there being though, he was always, teams were always competing for him, right? It wasn't more cost for him to move. His reputation wasn't tied to one location. And so there, if there's more competition, right, potentially he was able to get kind of higher wages as opposed to being stuck with the lower wage because it was going to be very costly for him to leave this team that he'd been with for forever. Right? So it's an interesting, it's just another thing that we want to th be thinking about with wages, just looking at the labor market more. So we kind of already talked about this, this brand, you know, maybe you could argue with LeBron James, um, kind of moving teams that's hurt his brand potentially, but but maybe it's, it's you know, made, made him higher wages or higher salaries in the NBA, but maybe it's cost them a little bit outside. Um, so how much less um, will kind of be that difference between whatever that leave wage was and what the equilibrium wage was with the current team that he was on. So I'm going to skip this because I don't 
I don't, it doesn't fit necessarily perfectly in. And I think we'll revisit this at a later, at a later call. So um, we looked at that one paper about in-season effects, labor market participation. So I really wanna make sure we kind of get a, a significant portion of time on discrimination today. So we'll have three types of discrimination that we can think about, and they act a little bit different. Pretty, pretty similar. I mean, they have similar end, of, end results, but they're all going to operate slightly differently. Okay. So the first one is let's think about if we had employer discrimination. Okay. So I think I labeled it here domestic foreign. We could break this down, you know, white and kind of non-white, however we want to think about this. The domestic foreign one is actually pretty uh, relevant when it comes to something like uh, European soccer, right, where we've got different nationalities and potentially there's, you know, some... Uh, I don't know, not so uh, good relationships between those, right? So we've got domestic and foreign will just be the, the two groups we're thinking about here. I would argue this was probably something you, the MBA could probably maybe think about too. There is, you know, and when I say discrimination, right? It may not be that people, I don't know, the employer has hate for that player. It may just be that they, they don't like their style of play, like European style basketball or something like that. So, you know, it doesn't have to be like the most, uh, evil kind of thing or whatever, but we are thinking about it could also you know, apply to just kind of the, the general form of discrimination that we might think about. So we've got domestic and foreign players, and let's say they both kind of have the same productivity labor, or they're both having that same number of additional wins that they're bringing to the team. So same quality, right? We've assumed identical quality between the two groups. So when we think about discrimination, we think about you know, everything that we analyze in economics is really cost benefit, right? And so for kind of benefits and costs. So when we think about discrimination, we, we think about it as an additional cost, right? If the employer employs the, the foreign player, which they're discriminatory towards, there's some additional psychic cost of doing so. Okay. Or if you want to think about it this way, the, um, the benefit or the, the utility that the, the team feels, if there is anything other than kind of monetary that they're, they're built in there, it's like there's less of a benefit. Right? So what we should be thinking about, do I have it here? No, I don't. So, oops, I'll draw it out for us. So let's say I've got kind of discriminatory behavior, beliefs towards the, the foreign player. So let's assume got here. So I'm also going to assume that the supply per, for labor for domestic and foreign, foreign players is the same. Right? And we also said that the demand curve should be the same for both, right? They have the same quality. We're thinking about the same team signing them, so they have the same marginal revenue per win. So, you know, it should be that they both end up getting paid This equilibrium wage. Yeah. Why is this? Why did they say that supply be equal to the marginal cost and there is an incentive cost? So remember, these are the marginal costs to the players. With employer discrimination, that cost is coming from the teams. So I haven't drawn that yet because the additional cost means that this demand curve, right, the value to the team, well, it's now whatever the additional revenue those additional wins from the player was bringing in. So we think about this here. But now there's this additional cost, right? So from these discriminatory teams, that demand for foreign players is actually going to be lower, right? Because there's this additional cost to employing them. So this is what it should be. This is what the actual value of the player, both domestic and foreign is. But here is the value to the team. And so now we end up with this foreign player getting paid a lower amount. Right? Um, and even if you think about if we were supplying the exact same amount of labor, they would still be kind of getting you know, a lower equilibrium wage as well. Now, I'm just kind of pointing out here if they were to kind of, you know, if we think about the quantity of labor, not as like a quality of labor hours, but like just the number of games being paid, or sorry, paid, played, then we would still kind of see this lower wage. So if I gave you a problem like this, you know, I would specify 
you know, identify the equilibrium wage, the new equilibrium wage. The only way that I would kind of want you to identify this point is if I said something like identify the wage that the team would have to pay the player to get the same quantity of labor from them. Yeah. Is this like a, kind of like a real incentive? Like, is this like a real, there's been a correlation of this in certain weeks? Yeah. So I think uh, I will look at a paper here at the end of class that just shows maybe some, some evidence of, of discrimination going on within the game. Um, but I know that there's a couple papers and we'll look at uh, one specifically next week. It's focused more on coaches. Um, so this would be the idea of discriminatory employers towards coaches, but the same thing would, you know, be, it would operate the same with player salaries. And they, they find that teams are less likely in the NFL to hire black coaches to be coordinators, right? And not head coaches, but the problem is that the probability of becoming a head coach increases dramatically if you are offensive or defensive coordinator. So indirect, like, so through that, we would see salaries be impacted. So there is some evidence at the coaching level that's going on. Um, I think there's also a paper we'll, we'll look at, which looks at it for players. To be completely honest, I can't remember how strong the result is there. I think they find some evidence, but it's not actually as strong as, as you would think. And so currently it looks like maybe the employers aren't discriminatory or we don't have as much discrimination going on. Um, although I know there's a paper that looked at TV viewership for NFL games when there was a black and a quarterback versus a white quarterback, and they found evidence of consumer discrimination, which is another type that we'll go through. But in terms of salaries, um, I don't believe, I can't think of one off the top of my head. I'd have to look at Google Scholar and go search and see if there, there's something more recent that I'm not aware of. Could we see something like this with like necessarily like a free agency signing, but like kind of draft? Uh, like draft order or draft? Uh, so, yeah, let me think about this. So you're asking if, not through the wages, but would it make it pr probably probably not? I would say only because if you're in the draft, there's likely uh, another player of a similar quality who would be of not a group you're discriminatory towards, or um, if there is, if there isn't, sorry. Um, the value of that player still to other teams would be this, like the non-discriminatory team. So it would still be beneficial for you to use them as trade capital. Right? So I, I don't know how you would get at it with the draft, but you, you could look and just see whether or not teams are, um, you know, certain teams are more or less likely in certain positions to draft white versus non-white players or whatever. The, 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 um, so we've got this lower kind of wage that these discriminatory employers would pay, but does it really matter, All right? So we think about, we would see kind of a lower kind of wage for whatever group's being discriminated against. Um, so lower wage is a potentially a lower number of players. Like we look at that quantity of labor, potentially we see the, the quantity decrease as well. So we've got lower wages and potentially fewer of those you know, every group's being discriminated against um, kind of working relative to if there was no discrimination going on. But one thing that's kind of nice with discrimination, not nice with discrimination, but one thing that, that is good, right, or at least uh, I think uh, lets us think maybe discrimination won't be as big of a concern, is that let's think about if we've got free agency or even if teams are allowed to trade. Right? If teams, if all teams discriminate, then yes, we will see lower wages for that group that's discriminated against. You know, if you go back to, to when the, you know Major League Baseball uh, was first integrated, I'm sure the vast majority of owners there had some discriminatory kind of you know psychic cost there. Maybe not. Maybe there's a couple, right? But let's just assume all of them were. Then yeah, they're all going to be paying lower wages. However, what if one team owner does not discriminate? So if there's one team owner that doesn't discriminate, what would they be? And let's just say currently with discrimination, foreign players are being paid 
this wage by every team. Every team is only going to offer them this wage. If there's one team that's not discriminatory, they'll pay the player wherever we would be at on the actual value of that player to the team, right? Without that additional cost. So that non-discriminatory team will be willing to pay the player this higher wage. So if I'm the player and we've got free agency, what team am I going to choose? Not only can I get a higher wage by choosing the non-discriminatory team, but I'm not playing for somebody who doesn't, you know, has a psychic cost to be playing for their team, right? If you're right, we could complicate this model, which is that if players have an additional cost to playing for the owner that is discriminatory, then we would also kind of have simultaneous shifts. And then we might have this idea where, you know, well, think about this way, um, you know, cost to the player would be lower on the non-discriminatory team. So maybe we actually see, we wouldn't know if they would be accepting a higher or lower wage, right? It kind of depends on how much the cost of the player was and also how much that cost the employer was kind of pushing their wage down. Yeah, you could complicate it even further. Yeah, but if we just want to think about, let's look at assume away for a second that, you know, I'm playing for the team. I don't deal with the, the owner that often, right? It's not going to cause the, the player a lot of additional strife. Um, but uh, so even if I'm on that team, we, we would kind of assuming away that supply difference. But you're right. We can complicate it even further and add in a supply difference there as well. So it, even if there's one team, so if there was one non-discriminatory team, why might it still be an issue? So I, I said they'd be willing to pay this player up to this wage, but what do they, what do they know about every other team? Every other team is offering this player a much lower wage. So what do I have to do as the non-discriminatory team? Yeah, just offer him like, just a wage slightly above it, right? As long as I can beat out the offer from these other teams, and so, yeah, wages will be slightly higher once we have this one non-discriminatory team, but they still have some power. They don't have any competition, right? Because they know that every other team is not willing to pay the player as high as what their actual value would be. So one non-discriminatory team it makes things a little bit better, but not, not a lot. What happens if we have two non-discriminatory teams? Well, now, if one of them tries to offer this player slightly higher wage than what they get from discriminatory teams, what's the second non-discriminatory team gonna do? Yeah, it's a little bit higher. And what's the other one gonna do? And so as soon as you have competition, then we get up to that wage that's exactly equal to the value of that player. Right? So we need at least two non-discriminatory teams to really just get back to players being paid exactly what their, their value is. Yeah. Would this be an incentive to not discriminate because the team that doesn't discriminate gets an entire roster of better players? Yeah, so the idea there being if I'm truly discriminatory, I have, uh, like, I'm, if this is, has a cost to me, I'm willing to pay that cost. Like, I'm willing to give up things because I don't want to incur this additional cost. So by not paying these players higher, as high wages or even not employing them, you might see a decrease in the quality of your team. You might see a decrease in revenue, but you're okay with that because I would, you know, let's say hypothetical that employing this player had a, you know, this uh, owner would pay up to a million dollars not to have someone, a foreign player on their team. Well, if I don't have a foreign player on their team, what am I willing to give up that thousand dollars? So there would be a loss potentially in revenue that they, we might see these teams because they're not hiring or they're not employing whatever group they're discriminatory towards, but they're okay paying that as long as their loss in revenue is less than whatever that cost is to it, to employing the player. I would say today, I mean, the loss in revenue of not just hiring a player because of their race, right? If you have to go down to the next quality player, right? I, I, don't think this is probably existing a lot uh, anymore from owners, but I also don't know all the, the owners, right? So um, how much that would, you know, they would think, you know, I don't know, maybe the guy, uh, what was his name out in the, for the Clippers, you know, maybe he was doing so. It'd be interesting to kind of look at the salaries of Clippers, Clippers players that are back in that time period. 
So we've got these, you know, as long as we can get two of these non-discriminatory teams, things can kind of get better for that group. Now, you know, it does get more complicated, right? If there was only two teams who, you know, I, I think uh, who would said it because you're, you're thinking about it, right? Well, they're going to always be able to end up with higher quality players, right? These other discriminatory teams are sacrificing out on being able to obtain the higher quality players just due to the fact that they were foreign players. And so we might see kind of these non-discriminatory teams actually rise in quality, right? So incentives are always good. And if the incentive is to not be discriminatory, it's going to help us kind of eliminate some of these wage differentials that we would think might exist because of discrimination. All right, so we kind of had that. We said, what about, I said half teams here, but really all we need is two, right? So as long as we can get two teams here, we get wages back up to where they should be for that group. Um, and we can kind of think about it in a way to get the same level of talent, these discriminatory owners are going to have to pay a premium, right? Because, um, you know, they're, they're uh, think about it this way. If I want to get the, uh, if I am just only getting domestic players, right, then I'm going to have to always be paying that higher wage. Right? If, I, if I don't want to hire foreign players, I'm always going to be paying that kind of higher wage for discriminatory team. So the, the, uh, the incentive there is to kind of not be discriminatory. Right? Or you can kind of think about how that would impact wages. Um, let's think about here. We already mentioned this non-discriminatory teams would therefore we think would quality would increase as a result. Okay. So do wages tell the entire story, right? Um, if we assume that we have foreign and domestic players, right? If we're just looking at kind of averages for salaries, we're not doing any type of regression analysis. Well, we might see that certain groups, you know, maybe foreign versus domestic players are, you know, are paid a different average salary. But if European style basketball really doesn't work as well in the NBA, well, maybe there's some quality differences there as well. Right? Or maybe the group that's being discriminated against, maybe they are just a little bit um, on average, have a higher kind of marginal number of wins that they bring into the team. Right? So we could think about like two players. Like let's say we have the best two players, right? but not one of them is number one, one of them is number two. Right? So let's say, um, We'll do player one is kind of domestic. Actually, no. I want player one to be kind of foreign. And then we have player two being a domestic player. And, you know, just to put a number to it, maybe the marginal wins coming from this player's labor, maybe 20 games here, maybe only, I don't know, 18, right? We're kind of thinking about there's a slight, we're going from the best player to the second best player. So what would this look like if we were drawing this out in terms of the labor market? And why might we still see the foreign player paid more, even though we have employer, discriminate, employer discrimination? Right? Well, once again, we'll just assume that these players don't know about discrimination, that the supply curve for both, and actually here we can call it player one, player two is exactly the same. We then have maybe our demand curve for domestic player. I keep, I don't know why I'm doing domestic here. Player number two, right? Who is the domestic player? So we see player two's equilibrium wage be right here. I think about their equilibrium kind of quantity of labor that they will supply to that team be right here. For the foreign player, right? Their demand curve should be what relative to player player two. Player one's demand curve for their labor should be, yeah. If we're thinking about the same team, same marginal win per labor. If their marginal wins per labor is higher, we should see the demand curve for that player be up here, and we should see kind of the wage for player one be right there. Now the problem is what's also going to exist in that demand curve for player one. Well, if we still have discrimination against foreign players, there's this additional cost then to the teams. So we'll call this the demand curve plus discrimination. 
equilibrium wage for player one, kind of with discrimination. So would we'll be down here. So they're still getting paid more, right? They are the better player that drives their wage up, but they're not getting paid as much as they should be if the teams weren't discriminatory. Okay? So we still might see, like, we look at the data, the wages won't tell us the entire story because we can't see what the players should be getting paid. Right? We only see what they are paid, right? And if they are of higher quality, right, we, we could still see them have a higher wage. It's just not as high as it should be without discrimination. Okay. Does that make sense there? Why, why we have kind of, you know, so this is almost like the green line here is almost like a without discrimination or like hypothetically, right? But if we have the discrimination, then the actual demand curve would be down there, right? If to factor in that additional cost that we have uh, from the employer's discrimination. Questions before we keep moving there? Oh, yeah. Okay. oh okay. All right, so got kind of that idea. Um, so if we go back, oops, I'm trying to think about Major League Baseball. Um, you know, this was, was existing at the time where there was a lot of discrimination towards black players. And so the wages that were being offered in um, Major League Baseball were artificially low. Right? So what that actually allowed for, once there got to be a stock, a large enough stock of players who were high quality, who were in the group that was, you know, black players who were being, being discriminated against, well, if I now have a good block of high quality players, that's just as good as the high quality players in Major League Baseball, I can actually start a competing league, right? And there, teams will actually pay the players wages. You know, it's a non-discriminatory league, so they'll be able to earn higher wages, right? And that the wages being offered from the MLB will always be lower because all those owners were discriminatory right, at the time. Excuse me. And so as a result, right, we kind of saw, um, oops, we kind of saw that because these high quality players, right, their demand for their labor was so high, we actually saw the creation of, of the Negro League, right? And it was highly successful, right? Like one of the, it's going to be one of these cases where we actually had a competing league, right? We haven't seen that in like modern eras, but at the time it was competing with Major League Baseball. So eventually what starts happening to the demand curve for Major League Baseball? Now? There's now competition and this other high quality, you know, league that's competing with them. The demand curve is kind of, or you want to think about it, the entire demand for baseball is now being split, right? So essentially, Major League Baseball started to see a decline in their attendance and kind of, um, you know, the prices they could charge for tickets. And so as a result, right, it was kind of forced, I mean, they weren't forced, but they, they wanted to integrate, right? They always said, well, look, you know, we are discriminatory. I said earlier, right, I've got some cost to employing this group that I'm being discriminatory against. But as soon as the loss in revenue is greater than that cost, uh, I'm, not, I'm not as concerned with being discriminatory anymore, right? Because I'm now kind of losing out by, by, um, by being discriminatory. So, it's, so once we had that occur, once revenues fell enough, we saw the integration of, of baseball. Right? And we started to see Major League Baseball teams kind of employ um, Black players, which eventually you know, led to you know, essentially the... the uh, the demise or kind of the elimination of the Negro League, and we had kind of full integration. The only problem is there, if the employers are still discriminatory, yeah, they're going to take the high quality players from that league, and maybe they're offering them higher wages, but like not as high as, as they should be, right? And so that's kind of how we saw integration was really forced through revenue losses of Major League Baseball. It's not like they, their hearts all of a sudden changed. Right, it's just that the losses in revenue became greater than their, you know, costs for discrimination, right? psychic costs. Um, so even with discrimination, oh, I kind of already mentioned, you know, maybe we saw um, that they should be, you know, they still were able to get higher wages in Major League Baseball, but not as high as they should have, right? Because the discrimination really still was existing. All right. So what else kind of helped cause uh, integration here was really 
I can't already mention this, but the value of the, the highest quality players just got so good in the competing league, right? That Major League Baseball was taking too large of a hit, right? So, um, you know, that's not an issue if there's an equal number of kind of white players, right, that the teams could employ as well. But basically, the, the supply of white players just wasn't high enough so that they couldn't provide a, a higher quality product than the, the competing Negro League, right? So, um, you know, the revenues decline, eventually we see integration occur. So, you know, sometimes, you know, economic forces, uh, you know, they don't, they don't change uh, what's in people's hearts, I guess. Um, but if the incentives get large enough, at least we can get some good end results for society. Right? All right, so I think we'll go to the paper and I think um, we'll talk about a little bit about statistical discrimination next class. We'll do employee and then we do consumer discrimination. Right? So we got three types, but I do want to go over this paper and do a little bit of linear regression stuff here today. So I just, this is a unpublished paper that I that came across um, and I was thinking of doing something similar to what they did. So I was a little upset, but um, it's a very interesting idea. Right? So we're not going to be looking at wages with this paper, but we are going to see whether or not there's any cross race discrimination going on in terms of foul calls in the NBA. So the NBA does this, it started doing this thing and I, they mentioned it here somewhere in the paper, uh, maybe at the beginning, I don't remember what season they started, but they started reviewing the last two minutes of close games and had people go through the videos and to figure out if referees were making incorrect calls. So they were looking for the number of times that a foul was called when it shouldn't have been, and the number of times when there was no foul called, and through the video, the league believed that there should have been. So they put out all these reports for these close games, the last two minutes of close games, and from that, you can basically determine, well, when are they making incorrect foul calls, and when are they making incorrect no calls, right, when they should have called a foul. So that the paper references is type one and type two errors. So if you go back to your 221 days, Type one errors has been when we reject the null, even though we shouldn't have been. So this is the idea that a foul was called, even though there shouldn't have been a foul. And then type two errors is when I fail to reject a null hypothesis, even though I should have been. So there it's, I failed to make a call, a foul call, so a no call, even though there should have been a foul, right? So that's, that's all they're, they're meaning with type one, type two errors there. Basically type one errors is when fouls were called, when there was no foul, type two would be, there was a no call, even though we should have been. So the idea they have in this paper, and actually, before I write it out, let's see if they've got it in here. Typical thing. So we'll scroll down, get to the data portion where we look for that regression equation. If I can find it. Maybe they don't have one. Um, oh, here we go. So this is kind of their regression equation. Now, we have to know what all of this is, right? But basically, they're thinking about whether or not there was a foul called when there shouldn't have been. If the player that the foul was called on was identified as kind of a black player, I forget how they, they did this. Um, there's actually papers. This is kind of interesting. Um, you can like just use pictures and do like, you know, the RGB, like red, blue, green thing. You can actually determine um, someone's like, you can just use their skin tone. And you can actually make a continuous measure of kind of, um, you know, I guess, uh, individual's color but like that's I think um they didn't do that they actually went to a database and this was just self-reported you know, whatever race that that um players were were responding with so um they then kind of control for who the referee was right some referees might make more foul calls than others but they then got kind of interested in okay so look at the first regression result which was Right here. Right? Nope. First regression result is way of. I guess that wasn't. So here it is. Right? So here they were just looking at whether or not black referees are more or less likely to call fouls on black players. So thinking about is there some type of inter or intra race kind of discrimination going on? And they find, you know, depending on their kind of controls that they include, 
right? Nothing's really statistically significant here. So we don't really can't say that this is any different from zero. So a black referee is no more or less likely to call foul on a black player or incorrectly call foul on a black player. Um, so this is good. At least we don't see any really discrimination kind of going on here. Because even if this was uh, negative, that would mean that they're more likely to call fouls on white players. So we don't see any kind of discrimination going on here. Yeah. Yeah, so sometimes, yeah. So when we look at some of these papers, a lot of the times you can read through, like notice here, they tell you what all these controls. So they included the players' rebounds, fouls, turnovers, steals from that season. They controlled for the minutes, right? Everything's per 48 minutes. So they're controlling for the fact that certain players play more than others, that they play more, they're more likely to get a foul called on them, right? And so they'll outline kind of what they use. Here, this is more of a shorthand, right? So when they say like, did we include player statistics, which includes all of these additional control variables, these are kind of like your more naive regressions because they didn't include any of those. What, usually what they'll do is they'll kind of build as you go across the columns. So each column here represents a separate regression. And notice there's more and more yeses because they're just adding in more and more controls. Once they add in all of their controls, they do have a positive effect here, but it's, it's not statistically significant. So we can't say that it's any different from zero. Okay? We don't have any stars here. Okay? Any questions up to, up to that point yet? I think it's a little bit more interesting. So the next thing that they do is they also break this down into, were they incorrectly calling a foul or were they incorrectly having a no call, right? And here, right, if it was, you know, if the committing, you know, the, the player that the foul was called on or the foul wasn't called on was black, it looks like for an incorrect foul call, there's no real statistical, statistically significant effect but it looks like there's some incorrect no calls going on. So it looks like black players are slightly more likely to not get called for a foul when they actually commit. Right? So maybe there's some discrimination going on here, but where is it really coming from? So they get this idea and say, well, look, maybe it's because, you know, and you could, you could set this up either way. You could do white players, white referees, or black players, black referees. Maybe there's some type of, you know, intra or intra, race discrimination going on here. And so they include this indicator for whether or not the referee was black and then interact it with whether or not the player is black. Right? So when we do these interaction terms, if you're thinking about here, was a foul called? And we have kind of player was black, we have referee, right? So we have the, the race of the player and the referee. Right? So this coefficient will tell me, okay, one unit increase. Well, these are all indicators. These are all just one zero variables. So if the player is black relative to not, is there an increase in the probability of foul is called, right? And I think they then change this to like, was it an incorrect foul called and was a no call called, right? But here, because it's a one zero variable as our dependent variable as well, our coefficient kind of the interpretation is changes in the probability that we see a foul being called or whatever that Y variable is. And then here, this coefficient would be if a referee is black relative to, to not, right? do we see an increase in the foul called on, on players? Right? But then what we're really interested in is because we could, we could find no effect from both of these things. So black players are no more or less likely to have a foul called on them. Referees, regardless of their race, are no more or less likely to call a foul on any player, right, just overall. But if we interact these, now the only time that this variable, this new variable we created, you can kind of think about like this is uh, like a new variable X that we created, just the interaction of these two variables. Well, now the only time this is a one is when the player is black and referee is black. Right? Any other combination, this is always zero. So this coefficient will now tell us the additional you know, increase in the probability of fouls called on a player who is black when the referee is also black. You know, maybe this is you know, positive or negative, we're not sure, right? So we'll go to the, the results. Oops, maybe. 
there we are. And so that interaction, well, looks like maybe black referees are a little bit less likely to call fouls on black players, but nothing's significantly different from zero here. So still good news, right? We still don't have any evidence of discrimination. They then um, look at kind of incorrect fall calls, similar thing, right? They just change the dependent variable to was there an incorrect foul call, no more or less likely to incorrectly call a foul on a black player if the referee is less. So still no discrimination. Here's where it gets interesting. Well, now it looks like maybe there is some discrimination going on, but it's actually kind of, um, you know, not as overt. It's not in the, that a foul is called when there isn't one, but it looks like that when, for black players, when the referee is black, they're a little bit more likely, right, to have an incorrect no call. So the referee is a little bit less likely to call the foul, even though there was one. Um, so, you know, I mean, this is maybe some evidence of discrimination, but like, uh, Maybe we can dive into it a little bit deeper, right? And so this, conversely, this would mean uh, white players are more likely to not have an incorrect no call right, coming from a black referee. So maybe there's evidence there's a little discrimination going on. Okay. We'll keep going down here because they then break this down uh, into, I'll skip this table. This is interesting because I want to show you this one. So this is where it gets kind of really interesting, right? And, you know, I am not like a sociologist. And to me, like the race stuff always just blows my mind that it, it's even a, a thing that, that occurs. But like here we've got more evidence that there's some type of weird race relations going on within the cohort of referees, right? If this paper ends up getting published, my guess is the NBA is really not going to like this. But here's kind of an indicator for whether or not the player who had and so what we really, we found the most effective with the no calls, right? That's where we found that significant effect. So here they're going to look, okay, we're only going to look at kind of black referees. And so now we only have to include the indicator for whether the player was black, right? So are black referees more likely to call a foul on black players when, right, both of the other referees are white? Well, if both, so there's three referees in the court. If two of them are white and one of the referees is black, that black referee on a black player is no more or less likely to incorrectly not call a foul. However, what about when one of the referees is black, other referees is black, one of the other referees is white? Well, that's where we actually see that's what's driving this effect. Right? So a black referee is what, about 3.5%, right? A probability increase of 0 0.035. So about 3.5% more likely to not call a foul on Kind of a black player if one of the other referees in the cohort is also black and kind of here we kind of see when both of the other referees are black maybe there's an effect but the significant statistical significance goes away part of that's because sample sizes are kind of lower here but it does look like there's some type of kind of race relations that i they, they in the paper they call as a peer effect right that when a black referee has other black referees in the game with them, maybe they, you know, are, are, are not as, um, or I don't know, maybe they're a little bit more discriminatory as opposed to when they to have two other, other white referees. Or maybe what's driving that is that they're just more likely to kind of call fouls on, on white players when they have white, play, uh, white referees in their cohort as well. So we'll see the playoffs in between those two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so some of these other variables are significant. So the main goal of this paper was they wanted to look and see if there was discrimination going on with foul calls. They found some evidence. Now, it's not egregious evidence, right, in the fact that at least fouls weren't being called when they shouldn't have been. But it looks like maybe, you know, there's some type of, of weird kind of race relations going on within the cohort of referees that the racial composition of that cohort changes their behavior in terms of when they're not calling a foul when they think there might be one. Right. Um, and that that's really being driven by the fact that, you know, whatever that composition of that cohort is. So I think they also do this for white referees and white players. And they kind of find a similar thing that when a white referee is in a cohort with two other black referees, they're way more likely to not correctly call a foul on a white player. So this is 
both kind of races having some type of discrimination of, to the other race. Or actually, I think like here, it's not the other race, it's actually to their to their own, right? Um, or no, this would be, right? Because a no calls a bad thing, right? So we actually kind of see some across race discrimination going on, not just from one group, right? We have both white referees and black referees where we see that when the racial composition of the other referees is just, you know, kind of uh, you know, here when both the other referees are black and up here, when kind of at least one of the other kind of referees is black, we've got kind of these incorrect no calls, right? So that was kind of the main goal of their paper was to search for this discrimination. But you're right. If we look at all these other variables, we can interpret all of them as well. So for instance, here in a playoff game, it uh, looks like that slightly more likely to have incorrect no calls. So maybe you know, referees are in a playoff game. They don't want to make the call that, uh, you know, that changes the game. And so they're a little bit more likely to, to not call a foul, even though there was one. And if we looked at kind of white referees, I'm going to guess that well, we don't find anything different from zero there. But um, let's see if there's any other variables that were significant here that were interesting. I saw one the other day. Oh, here it is. This is very interesting, right? So how light am I more likely to not get a foul called on, on me when I actually did foul if the player who they didn't call the foul on was on the home team? Huge positive effect, right? So this is the idea that referees are less likely to call fouls on players when, when they're at home, right? Um, so you can interpret a bunch of these different variables. They showed some of them, um, but not all of them, right? The other ones, they just kind of list down here in the footnotes of the paper. Okay. Uh, where was this one? This one is a, was a little bit more surprising to me that if the player was an all-star, didn't really impact whether or not there was an incorrect no call. But I think if we go up here to the foul one, not incorrect call. So here's the foul call. Notice playoff games, they're much less likely to just call fouls. Um, and then uh, if it's a the player was a starter, right, they're a little bit less likely to call fouls on starting players, which would mean more likely to call fouls on kind of bench players there as well. So we can interpret a bunch of their different variables, but their main story was there's not like egregious discrimination going on. But it looks like there's some type of weird race relations between the referees that depending on the composition of the cohort, maybe we're a little bit more likely to see no calls on kind of the same, you know, whoever the referee or race of the referee is on that on that uh, player race. Any questions kind of over any of this or, or kind of about regression analysis in general? So next week, I'll bring in some more, uh, another data set on Tuesday. We'll kind of uh, we'll do a little bit of discrimination stuff at the beginning. And then the second half of class, we'll kind of look at a data set. I'll play around some stuff in Excel. We'll run some regressions, do some interpretation of the coefficients that we get. Um, other than that, if you, if you, you, know, you should maybe start at least, kind of if you haven't, you know, working on the data portion of that project. If, you know, I think I've got, I got more of them out this morning. So I think there's one or two where I either told you to do a hypothetical kind of regression, or uh, if you haven't got it from me, please email me, because that probably means that something got lost in, in an email or I didn't, uh, didn't get, to get the right email for you. So um, you should start kind of working on that. If you have any questions as you're doing that, feel free to stop by, set up a time to meet with me, kind of help you kind of work on that data analysis portion. Um, and other than that, the homework's up there. Uh, and I will see you guys on Tuesday.